Uh, it's time for the, the message um, this evening, and I'm going to talk about the passage which really is at the heart of love running. It really encapsulates everything that we talk about when we say love running. You should know by now that we, um, we don't mean that we love running, although, you know, it kind of grows on you a little bit, I guess. But what we're saying primarily is that we want to see love running to where it's needed the most. We want to see it taken to where it is uh, most necessary and to see love making the difference. So I've got a little um, Bible passage. This one is going to be read out and done on a video. It's Luke chapter 15. It's the story of the prodigal son. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms round him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the elder son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The elder brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Let's pray. Dear Father, we want to ask that you would speak to us this evening. And Father, the cry of my heart is that wherever we are each out on our spiritual journey, I want to pray that there will be something of the love of God the Father that touches us, that gets through to us, that cleanses and changes and, and renews us. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you know, uh, I, I, I have to say, I'm normally quite a jaded and cynical person, but tonight I find myself so happy, so excited, so overwhelmed, so privileged to be able to share this moment with you, uh, with those of us that are here right now, with those that are in the crypt uh, watching downstairs, and with those that are watching this on the internet in the future. Uh, it's a wonderful thing. But you know, there's a part of me that almost doesn't know what to say or how to say. I, I kind of know what I want to say, but it's so hard to express. Because what I want to say is I want to tell you about the love of God, the love that runs, the love that defines God. And when the Bible says, do you want to know what God is like? Do you want to know what is the, the defining characteristics, the core, the essence, the one thing that encapsulates the immortal, invisible God. It's not power. It's not judgment. It's not righteousness. 
even. It's love. Love, love, love. God is love. Some people, they look at Christianity and they think, well, I'm not sure about that because I'm not sure about religion. Do you know what? Me neither. But I am absolutely intrigued by the possibility of love. I want to know about the love of God. I want to experience that love in my life. And you know, sometimes we go through life and we're, we're so taken up with so many other things and so many legitimate aims and goals and we forget about love. And tonight, I want us to come back and remember love. This passage that we've had, the story of the prodigal son, it's been called the greatest story in human literature. It's a story that many of us have heard many times. It's a story that is taught in schools and and Sunday schools, and it's a familiar story. And yet there's something so profound about it. Sometimes it becomes so familiar we can lose the impact of it. But at the central heart of this story, you see a father who runs. It is love running. And whenever we think about love running, for me, my image is of this Palestinian father, this Middle Eastern man running towards his lost son. And if I could just experience that in my own life, if I could just experience God's reality and his love, then I know that it would change my life. And I know that it would change the world in which we live, that the world would never be the same if we could grasp the height, the depth, the breadth of God's love. And so when Jesus is asked about God, wants to express what God is like, he says, this is the best, the brightest, the biggest picture I can give to you, that he is a father who loves, who loves in a way that is almost supernatural. Love, divine, all loves, excelling. But you can't fully understand love And so you understand the context of that story. And it is about a boy who is lost. You need to understand that this young man in the story, the prodigal son, nowhere does it say that he was an evil boy. This is not a story about someone who was just wrong and bad. This is a story about you and me. This is a story about a boy who just lost his way, lost himself, lost his relationship with his father. At the end, the father says, he was lost, now he's found. Not, he was evil, now he's become a good person. Some of you, perhaps if you're not used to church, you can come into a place like this with a little bit of trepidation, and you think, well, what's with all the clapping? What's with all the band and the lights and the the, the kind of the the show? What is that all about? Is it a little bit unnecessary, a little bit over the top? But you just need to know that it is about Ordinary people who lose their way. He was lost and now he is found. This boy was actually lost, not partway through the story, but he was lost at the beginning of the story because when the Bible talks about lost, it's always in terms of relationship. You know, this boy, he he comes to his father. He says, Father, give me my share of the estate. He says, I don't trust you that you've got my best interests. A heart. I don't want to follow in your footsteps. I do not want to be my father. I want my own life. I want my own individuality. I want to go and do my own thing. And who of us can fail to identify with that? The Bible says he goes far away from his father. He takes his share in, in what is just a gross insult that brings tremendous shame upon his father's head. Because in those days, value and pr- uh, money was, was, it was counted in property. So in all likelihood, this father had to sell land that has been in his family for generation upon generation. So that this boy can go and reject everything that he stands for. And he goes to this far off country and he just wants to enjoy himself. He wants to find himself. He wants to have satisfaction. He wants to do his own things, have his own friends. And there's no finger pointing. There's no condemnation on that, but just a simple reality that actually somewhere along the line, he ended up lost. And actually things took a downturn economically for him. The money ran out. The parties finished up. And finally, he finds himself in this pigsty feeding pigs, which for a Jewish boy is a really bad situation to be in. You cannot get any lower. And at that point, he realizes how lost he really, really is. 
But in reality, he was always lost. It's not that he's physically lost. It's not that he doesn't know how to get back to his father. He doesn't know which country he's in or what the direction is home. He knows all these things. But the Bible says, you know, lost, it's more profound than that. And when you're lost, there's nothing more painful, nothing more difficult to deal with. When I was a kid, I was around about 11 years old. I won't tell the whole story, but I was essentially living uh, with my grandparents. My family were in Nigeria. Those of you that know me, I'm half Nigerian, half English. Half Nigerian means I've got rhythm. Half English means I can't dance. But that is... There's some Nigerians clapping there. But when it came to uh, secondary school, my parents sent me from Nigeria to live in York with my grandparents. And the plan was that I would travel home on holidays. The first holiday was Christmas holiday. I was 11 years old. My grandparents took me to uh, Leeds, Yeadon Airport. It was a foggy day. And so my grandparents said, Philip, listen, sweetheart, we're going to have to drive home. We can't wait. Your plane has been delayed, but we've been uh, assured that you'll be taken care of. But if we don't... Leave now, we'll get lost because this fog is just absolutely murderous on the road. So we've got to go, but you'll be fine. I was not fine. (laughs) I managed to listen out for the announcement. The nanny that was to take care of me never arrived. Uh, So I was all on my own. There was an announcement that came. It was a coach to take you to Manchester Airport. I negotiated my bags onto the coach. It's a bit of an adventure. But I went from the coach into Manchester Airport. I hung around for another couple of hours. I listened out for the announcement. Finally, there's an announcement that tells me that I need to get on a plane to Gatwick Airport. Fine. I get on the plane to Gatwick Airport. I make sure that all my bags are with me. I'm still kind of keyed up. The best thing ever in my life possibly happened in Gatwick Airport because the next announcement was that I had to get on a connecting flight to Heathrow But the connecting flight was a helicopter. First time, only time that I've ever been on a helicopter in my life. Very exciting. An adventure. I uh, don't exactly know what's going on, but I do know where I'm supposed to be going. I get to Heathrow. There's long, long waits. It's now been over um, 18 hours since I was dropped off by my grandparents until finally the announcement comes. There's a big plane that takes me right the way to Lagos International Airport. And when I arrive in Lagos International Airport, the airport is full of no parents, no mum, no dad, no little brother. And I am lost. I don't mind being lost for a little while. I can handle it. The first hour goes by. I'm sitting on a little plastic chair waiting for mum and dad to come pick me up. Two hours passes. Nobody is there. Three hours. I could take three hours. I was a strong kid. Four hours. And then finally, I've been waiting there for five hours, and something inside me just says, that's it. Enough is enough. Can we cry now? (laughs) So I'm crying. Airport staff come over, and they say, look, um, kid, where are you? I say, I'm lost. When I said that I was lost, it didn't mean that I didn't know where I was. I knew exactly where I was. I was in Lagos International Airport. I knew exactly where I was at every point of the journey because I knew that I was going somewhere. But when I arrive in a destination and my relationship is not there, that's when I'm lost. To be lost doesn't mean that you don't know where you are in life, but it does mean that you are missing something, that there's a connection that's not there. So you're lost when you've been on a bit of a journey through life and you're going through some things. You have some goals in mind. You're looking for that job, that promotion, that bank statement, that relationship. And you, you, you head your whole life towards these things. And then you get there and you find it's not satisfying. There's a na- nagging ache. There's a gnawing emptiness. There's a lack of joy. The Bible says you are lost, lost. It's a connection. I remember the guys, they said to me, who's going to pick you up? My parents, I said. Where do they live? Do they live in Abaddon? I said, uh, Lagos. I said, no, they live in Abaddon. They said, do you have anyone that lives in Lagos? I said, yes. I said, my grandmother. They said, what's her name? I knew this one. I said, my grandma's called Mama Agba. 
they laughed. Do you know, I never understood why they laughed until literally about five years ago, as an adult. I said to my dad, do you know I had this experience? I said, Mama Agba, they all laughed. My dad said, son, Mama Agba is Nigerian for grandma. <laughs> they didn't know what to do with me. They said, do you know where she lives, what her address is of this Mama Agba? I said, um, I said no, but I would recognize it if I saw it. <laughs> Maybe you could drive me around. I'm just spitballing here. And so they decided that they put me in a hotel. And uh, I don't know, I'd become a ward of state and, and grow up famous or something. Um, I was lost. I was so, so lost. And even though I was going to be taken care of, even though the, the material things were all settled, because that connection with the people that really loved me was missing, I was lost. Did you know that you were made to know God? God is your father. And that's why Jesus tells this story. He says, you've got to understand that we are all the boy. And we all have this connection with our father. And if you don't have that relationship with your father, you're always going to feel lost. You might have everything that the world says, have this. You might fill your life with all the distractions all the TV watching and, and the game shows and the soap operas, all the electronic gadgets, the iPhones and the iPads. You can fill your time with stuff and you can make your, your best job of it. But if you don't have that connection with your Father in heaven, you're always going to feel lost. You'll feel lost. And at one point, one day, this boy, he comes to a sense, as the Bible says, he says, listen, I... Maybe I got it wrong about my dad. Maybe he's not the harsh taskmaster that I thought he was. Because I, I ran away from one wealthy landowner, and now I am working for another wealthy landowner. But with this one, there's no relationship. I'm being treated so harshly, so poorly. Even my, master, my father's hired men, his servants, they have a better lot than I do. If I could just somehow get the old man to take me back as a slave. I'd be better off. And he decides that he'll make his way back. And this is where you encounter love. Love. I don't know what your picture of God is like. Maybe you imagine some impersonal force. Maybe you think, well, there must be something out there that made this whole universe. I mean, how do you get moral people with personality and, and language and humor and, and care and compassion and art and music. How, how does that just cut? It just, it, it's too wonderful. You know, we're so fearfully and wonderfully made, the Bible says. How, how do you get such miraculous, glorious wonder in the world without there being something behind it? But maybe you think it's just an impersonal force. Or maybe, maybe you think that God is like someone who's harsh, who's demanding, who has a list of little uh, things that he's got to tick off. He, he's got a checklist and you've got to come up with them and you can never come up to scratch with that kind of a God. Or maybe you think he's like some distracted old grandfather who sets the whole thing off in motion and then leaves us basically to get on with it and do our own thing. But Jesus says, listen, the way that you need to see God is a loving father. And he's running towards his son. And in those days, first century Middle East, men that had anything about them did not run. It was undignified. He just wouldn't do it. It'd be like seeing the queen parachuting into the Olympics. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. It's undignified. It'll never, ever happen. And yet he runs, he runs, he runs. The Bible says he saw him from a long way off. And even though he was a long way off, the father is running. He's kicking up a dust cloud behind him. His little sandals fly off behind him. His beard is flapping in the breeze. His arms and legs are just going like crazy. You know, he's just absolutely going for it. And all the people are coming out to watch and they're saying, hey, old man, hold up, slow down. You'll do yourself an injury. He doesn't care. 
He doesn't care about propriety. He doesn't care what people think. All he knows is, I love my child. I love my child. The Bible says that when he was a father, the father saw him and had compassion on him. Everyone say compassion. Okay, that word compassion, in the Greek, it's a special word. The Greek word is splanknizomai. Everyone say splanknizomai. Very good. I'll give you the shortened version. It's splanknon. And we get the word spleen from it because it literally means to be uh, stirred, to be twisted in your guts. It's talking about, well, this is the way that you understand it. In the mindset of biblical times, the seat of emotion was not the heart. You know, we think about the heart, love hearts, love is, where, this is where it comes from, the heart. But in uh, Bible times, for them, it was the gut. You know, it's not quite as nice, but it makes sense. Because when you fall in love, you can't eat, you get butterflies in your stomach. When you need to be strong and courageous, you need guts. So guts, that's where courage and strength and love and passion come from. So Valentine's Day, in first century Israel, you get a card with a picture of 40 foot of long intestine with an arrow through it. <laughs> but the word used, compassion, love, it's only ever used of God. It's that love divine, all loves, excellent. It means that his gut was wrenched. It means that he felt the strongest, most crippling, overwhelming love for his son. And he runs down, not with uh, judgment and oppression and criticism and condemnation, but with restoring of his dignity. He says to his servants, Get the, uh, the ring, put it on his finger, put a robe on him, sandals on his feet. And all the time that I ever read that story, I always used to picture just the old man running on his own. And then suddenly I, I realized one day when he talks to the servants and tells them to dress him, it means I need to revise my picture of the prodigal son and the father running towards him. I need to put in and factor in the servants. Because clearly where the old man goes, the servants have to follow. And so now I'm seeing the old man barreling down the high street and all his servants are following after him. And they're trying to keep up with the old fool, but they just, they just see the man go and it's incredible. I don't really know about servants. The only frame of reference I've got for that is Downton Abbey. <laughs> so I just kind of imagine one of the servants running back all out of breath and saying, Oh, Mr. Bits, I'm a bit out of puff, but the old master... He's gone running after the old young master. He's come back and he wants him to have a party. That was my impression. <laughs> and there's Bates. Mm. Well, sounds most irregular to me. <laughs> Certainly not what I would do. I can't say as I approve, lass. But... The old master wants what the old master gets. It's our job to do what he wants. So we're going to party like it's 1929. <laughs> and there's this amazing outpouring of love. When we come to God, it should be, and it is, the most wonderfully liberating, tremendously transcendent experience of our lives. Because here we come into love. Do you know what the Bible says about love? The best the best kind of stab at it that we have is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You hear this at weddings. It starts from verse 4. It says, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. That's what the father is doing. He says, listen, I'm not going to keep a record of wrong. Let the older brother do that. Let the religious folks do that who like to gather in buildings and wear special clothes and call everyone else a sinner. That's not who I am. That's not what I want done in my name. I don't keep that record of wrong because I'm willing to pay the price for all the wrong things that you have done. The Bible says that God so loved the world. He gave his one and only son. 
In other words, Jesus died on the cross as God himself come to live amongst us in this world. And that Jesus dies on the cross in order that we can be restored back to where we should have been in the first place. In relationship with the God who made us and loves us and knows us. You were meant for better things. You were meant to be in touch with the divine. You were meant to know him, to experience him. Our poor choices, our lostness, they rob us of so much. They crush the beautiful image of Christ inside our lives that we were born to reflect. They mess with our world. We have such pain in our world because we've got so lost. But Jesus Christ on the cross, he spreads out his arms and he says, I die. I give my very life in order that you might be restored, redeemed, set free, brought back, found in relationship. Do you know about the love of God? It says this, God would rather die than live without you. The Father, it costs him everything because he gives everything. His very last drop of blood. And you might say, well, I don't believe in God. Let me tell you, God believes in you. Because love, which is God's perfect character revealed, always protects, always trusts. Yes, God says, I always trust you. I've always believed in you. Even though you were far away, even though you've rejected me, even though you've done your own thing, I've never stopped looking for you. I've never stopped scanning the horizon. I've never stopped believing in you and persevering in my faith towards you that one day something would turn you back to me and you just give me a chance. The Bible says that if we draw near to him, he'll draw near to us, but he gives us the dignity of making first choice. That's why the boy was lost, but it was his choice. I'm going to try the old man. And actually you notice what he says in those two interactions with his father. The first time he says, father, give me. Give me, give me. Isn't that so much the human experience? We want it, we want it now. Give me, give me everything coming to me. Give me what you can. Give me something that's going to make me feel good about myself. But when he comes back to his father, the thing in his heart is, Father, would you make me like one of your hired servants? Give me, make me, give me, make me. That's a change. There's a change, and some of us, you know, we're plenty good at saying to God, give me. You know, when there's the crisis, little word of prayer to the man upstairs. But actually, the thing that changes your relationship with him, that enables you to be found, is when you're willing to say, make me. Make me what you want me to be. Make me a follower of Christ. This church is full of people who at one stage or another got down and said, God, I... I am lost. I might not look lost, but I know that if nothing else, I've lost my connection with you. Would you make me what I need to be? Would you make me what you want me to be? All of us, we've, we've made that decision. I think of it as an A, B, C. A, you admit that you've made mistakes, that you've lived your life without God. But B, you're willing to believe that God is good, that he is loving. You're willing to take a chance because you know there's nothing to lose. And see, you commit yourself to him. You say, God, I want you to have the say over my life. I want you to make me the kind of person, do you know, I can't live unselfishly. I can't live with compassion and grace and patience and perseverance and all those things. I would like to, but you've got to make me. And we've made that decision. It means that we're now on a new journey. But you know what? All of us, we've been surprised because we don't find a God who comes down at us with a big stick, but we have a God that says, right, <laughs> now we party. Now we rejoice. Now I wrap you up in my love and my compassion and my grace. So I'd like to pray a prayer right now and then we're going to just play out with a little bit of celebration and, and the band are going to come back. But I simply want with you know, humility, to offer a prayer. And this is a prayer for anybody who thinks, actually, somehow my connection with my Father God has gone astray, and I want to make it good again. I want to know love 
in my life. And it might be that this is an act of rededication. You, you, you've given your life to God in the past, but somehow you know that the wheels have come off a little bit. You're just going through the motions and all you're left with is a little bit of boring religion. But it might be that this is actually the first time you've ever done something like this. You've never consciously invited God to come into your life. You don't know what's going to happen. I can't tell you what's going to happen. All I know is that God treats you as his dear, dear child. And because you're an individual, it'll be different to what happened with me. But I can tell you that what happened with me, I have never, ever looked back from. All my years of following Jesus, it is the most wonderful way to live. It is, it's wonderful. So I'm going to pray a prayer. I'm going to pray this prayer. I'm going to invite you to pray the prayer along with me, just in the privacy of your own mind. And this is just for you. It's between you and God. You can even pray this prayer if you're not even sure if God exists. But actually, there's a part of you that's saying, look around. There's something here. What have you got to lose? So I'll pray it, and I'll make it slow enough so that you can hear it, echo it in your own mind. The prayer goes like this. Dear God, Father God, you know my life, the mistakes I've made, the wrong turns I've taken, the things I regret, the ways I've lived without you. I'm willing to believe that you are good. I'm willing to believe you are loving that you died for me. I don't understand everything. But if you've paid this price for me, then I want to invite you into my life. Welcome me home, Father. Put your spirit on me like a cloak. Bring me back to relationship with you. I trust my life to you, Lord Jesus. Make me what I was always born to be. I offer this simple prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for bearing with me. Just two things to say. What are the next steps? Well, here's one. We have an alpha course. You may have heard of them. There are no pressure, lots of fun, enjoyable way of gathering together with like-minded people, skeptics, cynics, believers, everything in between. Uh, we start two next month on June the 4th. We've got an evening one on Wednesday evenings that runs for seven weeks. You get cake, you meet here, and there's a talk, and then you discuss and then on June the 13th, there's a daytime one. If you can't make evenings, that one has a crash as well. We'd love to invite you there. You can take one of these flyers on your way out, sign up on the website. But if you prayed that prayer or you're thinking about it or you just would like a little bit more information, we've got these special discovery packs. You can get them here at the front from me or you can get them from a little table on your way out. And it just gives you an opportunity just to um, read a little bit about the Bible and take your journey the next few steps.